you're listening to the QuickBook Reviews podcast. Brighten your day with a book. Hello, my fellow bookworms. This is Philippa from QuickBook Reviews. How are you all? Are you okay? I am fine. I've had a wonderful holiday and I feel refreshed and restored. Yes, how long will that last? Anyway, before I go on waffling, let me tell you what we've got coming up. We have got a full interview with Tom Hindle, author of A Fatal Crossing. We've got Sabine Durrant, author of Sun Damage, coming on to answer five questions in five minutes. And as well as that, I'm reviewing Razorblade Tears by S.A. Cosby, Miracle Cure by Harlan Coben and Book Lovers by Emily Henry. Now, before we get on to that, let me tell you. So, yes, recovered from COVID, had a wonderful holiday. The flight, I think it was a mistake. The flight was 6am. And because of all the delays at the airports, we decided we needed to get there, you know, four hours beforehand, which meant we had to get up. I think it was 1am. So I came up with this idea of, right, we're all going to go to bed the night before at 7pm. So we will still have a decent sleep and be fresh and ready for the flight. So after a bit of faffing around when we realised that the luggage weighed so much, probably because the amount of books that I was taking with me. Right, get to sleep, get to sleep. (laughs) And we all lay there in our respective beds, not sleeping and uh, just willing time to go by. I think two of us had 30 minutes sleep, one of us an hour, one of us didn't even know if he'd been asleep. So... We were just too excited to actually have a holiday. And then the next day, boy, did we suffer. (laughs) The first evening we were on holiday. And I was like, come on, Philippa, put your lipstick on. You are on holiday. This is your first day. You've paid for this. You are not going to sleep through it. And you know when all you want to do is just go to sleep, close your eyes. It was just, yes, it was just right. We're staying. We're staying awake for this and it's happening. But it was wonderful. I've got more stories to tell. It's fair to say I took too many books with me. But I, I've only got a couple left to read through and then I've, then I've done. So each week I'll be dropping in some of my holiday reads as well because there are, well, there's some great reads and there are some shocking reads. So I think over time there will be a mixture for you. But I hope you're well. It's great to be back with you. And, and let's get started. So the first one, Fatal Crossing, Tom Hindle. This book is gorgeous. It was out in hardback originally and now it's out in paperback. And listen to this blurb. November 1924. The Endeavour set sail from Southampton carrying 2,000 passengers and crew on a week-long voyage to New York. When an elderly gentleman is found dead at the foot of a staircase, ship's officer Timothy Birch is ready to declare it a tragic accident. But James Temple, a strong-minded Scotland Yard inspector, is certain there is more to this misfortune than meets the eye. Birch agrees to investigate and the trail quickly leads to the theft of a priceless painting. Its very existence is known only to the owner and the dead man. With just days remaining until they reach New York and even Temple's purpose on board the endeavour proving increasingly suspicious, Birch's search for the culprit is fraught with danger. And all the while, the passengers continue to roam the ship with a killer in their midst. Let's go to the first first sentence. The rain fell all night. It poured relentlessly, hammering upon the Endeavour's deck and rattling against her steel funnels. Still, she carved her way through the Atlantic. Um, yes, excellent. As it says, uh, it says on the cover, a ship full of suspects, two detectives, one killer. You know it's going to be a great read, and it is. But let's go and talk to Tom now. Tom Hindle, author of the wonderful book called A Fatal Crossing. Welcome to the Quick Book Reviews podcast. Thank you. Hi. So let's start with the first question, an obvious question. I mean, I'm just wondering how you got the idea for this book. Were you on a murderous boat ride somewhere and you thought, oh, this would, this would make a good story? So I guess I have a bit of a confession on that front in that I've never had to been on a cruise before, despite <laughs> <laughs> despite the content of the book. No, it's an idea that's been with me for quite a while. So um, in various different guises, I guess. So I first had the idea for 
what became this story. When I was about 16, 17, I was in sixth form and I wanted to write a, a play that I could put on with some of my mates. And I settled on the idea of uh, a cruise ship or I came to the idea of a cruise ship um, because I thought it'd be quite easy to stage. Like there are only so many locations you need to create you know there's only like the restaurant and maybe a deck and maybe a cabin that you could use for sort of three or four different people's cabins so it was going to be a play and it wasn't it wasn't actually gonna be a murder mystery it's gonna be more of like a caper so I guess in the book you have a couple of different strands you have like the murder of a passenger but there's also missing painting and the play was going to be much more about the painting there wasn't going to be a detective it was going to be the passenger who loses the painting it was he was going to be sort of the character trying to get it back mm-hmm. um, and it was going to be a comedy um, and I, I only got halfway through it and then we all finished school and went to university so I essentially drastically underestimated how much time <laughs> it would take <laughs> to write a play um, but it's probably for the best because the jokes were terrible and I mean I I revisited some notes and the story probably wasn't that great but yeah it was going to be a play and then I I kind of sat on it for a few years so I was about 16 as I say when I wanted to write that play and then when I was about 23 24 I read Anthony Horowitz's Magpie Murders which for Mm. folks who haven't read it go and read it it's a great book it's uh, it's kind of a book within a book it's a book of two halves and the first half is this very quaint English village Midsummer Murders vibe kind of whodunit and I remember reading that and thinking I'd love to write something like this. And mm. I got thinking about my story on the ship again from a few years earlier. And I thought with some adjustments, you know, throw a murder in there, throw a detective in there, make it more of a murder mystery. That could be my story. And then spent a couple of years writing it. And well, and here we are today. Wow. So we have Anthony Horowitz to thank for this final version then. We do. I mean, we have Anthony Horowitz to thank for a lot. I think, yeah, you know, that's, my... that's true. OK, <laughs> we'll add it to the list. We shall. I mean, this is it. Like my first the first book I ever bought with my own pocket money was an Alex Ryder book. You know, I can vividly remember that was the first <laughs> book I ever bought myself. So I read Anthony Horowitz all through like my, my childhood and my teens as well. So it's kind of fitting that it's one of his books that gave me that urge to to sit down and actually write something for myself so yeah we <laughs> we have Anthony Horowitz to thank for an awful lot do you know that's so interesting because we often talk about the first record that we bought when we were a child but how many of us talk about what book what was the first book we can remember buying and yeah I suppose yeah. mine was famous five but I'm slightly older than <laughs> than you but we won't we won't dwell on that so once you'd had the Anthony Horowitz influence and dis- and could see it more was the story then completely set out in your mind or did it still come to you as you were writing it so I think once I decided I was going to write it I spent about six months planning it out working out so I revisited these old notes and what I'd written of the script for the play and worked out what I could keep and what I needed to change um, and you know a few obvious things like the cruise ship setting and the missing painting like they made it over but only one or two of the actual characters from the play made it over so I spent a good few months working out the new story if you like and working out what to keep and what to chuck out from the play um, and then I think so once I'd worked that out as I, say, I spent about 18 months writing my first draft but I did actually there were a few changes I made while I was writing so it was going to have it was going to have quite a different ending actually and I got about three quarters of the way through and I realized that something I'd I'd planned out in bullet point form that I needed one of my characters to do the character that I'd written in prose for 70,000 words or something just wouldn't do it it just didn't work as it just didn't work in that way so I ended up backtracking a little bit and working out okay well how should this book end instead with this this character that I've written as opposed to the character that I bullet point bullet pointed a year and a half ago and I think I ended up with an ending that feels quite a bit stronger than than what I'd initially planned but other than that I think yeah it all it's all pretty much as I as I planned it which which is a nice feeling but that must be quite a test when in your mind you thought, oh, it's heading in this direction. And then you realise to make the book really good, you need to change that. That, you know, part of me would just say, oh, well, I'll just keep going because <laughs> it, then it'll be over with all the writing. You're quite dedicated to your craft. I mean, I had to. It just wasn't working. Um, you know, so I, uh, the first three quarters of the book was there and I was happy with it and, and it worked as I planned it. But as I say, I got to this point where I needed... I needed a character to to do something pretty terrible for my ending to to work out, and 
it just, as I say, it just wasn't working. I just thought this character that I've written just won't do this. I was trying to push a round peg through a square hole. So I think the best piece, you know, the best piece of advice I've heard actually on writer's block is that um, writer's block happens when you're trying to force a story in a direction it doesn't want to go. And that was exactly how I was feeling. My, my story just wasn't going where I thought it needed to. So, yeah, the only option really was to backtrack and say, okay, well, I mean, I, I, yeah, it, it still ended up in roughly the same place. Um, I think it just got there in a slightly different way. And one or two of the characters end up having a slightly different ending. But... Yeah, backtracking and working out, okay, how what does this need to do instead? So that was definitely the right thing to do. Mm, that's that's really interesting. If it's not heading in the right direction, recognise that and, and do something about it. I mean, this is your debut book. What surprised you most as you were writing the book? Was there anything you were like, oh, I didn't expect writing to be like this? I think... As I say, I've never been on a cruise ship before, so trying. I've, obviously, I've never been to the 1920s yeah. before, so trying to work out some yeah. of those details that was quite surprising. <laughs> so, like, I spent I spent a whole hour trying to work out. You know, when you look at like the Titanic, for example, and you see like there's stretches of rope like between the top of the funnel and the deck. Like, there's loads of them. I spent an hour trying to work out if that's called rigging or if it's called something else. Because I guess if you think of, I think of rigging, and I think of like a pirate ship. You know, like kind of handmade rope and that sort of thing. So I spent a good hour trying to work out what that kind of rope would be called on a <laughs> on a cruise ship like the Titanic or something like that. So that was definitely a shock to the system, trying to work out those little details mm. and, and make sure I was being as accurate as I could. And how did you manage the pace and the twists and the turns? Did those just come as you were writing naturally or did you have to say to yourself, oh, there's been a lot of uh, twists and turns in this bit, Let let's calm it down for a bit? I think that probably came quite naturally. I was trying very hard to make sure I ended every every chapter on a bit of a cliffhanger. I think that's a good way of of keeping it working, or a cliffhanger, or a reveal, or just something that that makes your reader say, "Okay, I need to read this chapter. This next chapter, I need to see where this is going." So I was I was mindful of trying to do that, and I guess so. It did feel quite natural, I suppose, for those twists to keep coming as they did. Um, but maybe it felt natural because I was trying very hard to make sure I did that with the ending of my chapters, I'm not sure. But yeah, it did feel quite natural, I'd say. Which part did you enjoy writing the most? Was it, I don't know, the, the beginning, the middle, the end, a, a particular scene? I would say probably the end. Um, yeah. it's, I, I really want to talk about it, but I don't want to spoil it for folks who haven't read it. I think because I write, so I wrote the whole thing in order. So I've, I've heard a, a lot of different writers talk about different ways of doing it. And I know some of them, you know, some writers who I really admire will write the bits that they feel most excited about in that moment. And then they'll come back in the edit and they'll stitch it all together and make it all make sense. Whereas I'd written it, I'd started at the beginning and I wrote it a chapter at a time beginning to end that's just how I work best I think um, so getting to that ending and as I say having to kind of backtrack a little bit and come up with a, a slightly adjusted ending which I felt really really proud of once I'd worked it out I think getting to sit down and actually write that was was very very satisfying you know I don't I don't think it's a spoiler to say there's a twist at the end you know I guess you come to a murder mystery for a <laughs> for a big twist at the end so the big reveal I I knew I had something well, I felt at least that I had something that was that was quite good and quite exciting and I, I, that I thought would would surprise people. So getting to actually finally write that after you know a year or so of writing the rest of the book, that was that was a, a good feeling. I can remember where I was actually when I wrote I think for folk, guys who have read who have read the book already, if I just say that chapter or that reveal, yes, I think. Don't say any it, more than that. I yeah. won't say any more than that. But I remember I'd stayed over at my friend Mark's house and we'd had a poker night on the Friday night and I was awake first on the Saturday morning and I was waiting for the rest of the guys to wake up and I had my laptop with me. So I was there at seven in the morning slightly hung over <laughs> writing what I thought was the most exciting thing I'd ever written. So that was, um, yeah, that was probably the most satisfying part. Yes. And are you one of those authors that actually physically typed the end in or was it just a full stop and you were done? Uh, I did just so that I think I could convince myself more than anything <laughs> that I'd actually, yeah. I'd actually done it and I'd reached the end. So yes, I did write the end. <laughs> The scenes are very visual as well. So uh, as you have pointed out, you weren't around at, at the time the book is based and you haven't been on a on a, on a ship. So how did you visualise all of that? Um, I think I looked a lot at the Titanic. So, I mean, my, my 
but doesn't take place at exactly at the same time as you know what happened with the Titanic, but it's not far off. It's sort of out by a few years. Um, but I looked at a lot of... I think because of what happened to the Titanic, there's so much in the way of you know documentation in terms of... Um, you know, there are loads of books and there are loads of images you can go and see. But even on YouTube, like I went on YouTube and I found um, interviews with survivors. And of course, you know, they go on to talk about the iceberg and what happened there, because I guess that's what people are interested in. But they tend to sort of set the scene in those interviews at the beginning by talking about this is what it was like and this is what we were doing. And so I found a lot of those and I'd listen to sort of the first few minutes or so and then I guess tune out when they came onto the iceberg. So that that was really, really helpful. Um, but then, as well, I, I mean, I, I watched the film as well a few times. I would actually look for... So there's a bit sort of in the book that's set in, in the third class area of the ship, and I remember actually going and searching on YouTube again for specific scenes from Titanic that I knew took place in the third class sections of the ship. So I'd kind of make a few notes on that and then again go and cross-reference it if I could with some interviews from you know, survivors. But... I think one of the most amazing reviews I had, actually, and I couldn't quite believe this, was someone who had actually been on one of these ships left me a review on um, on Goodreads. So a lady who I guess must have been in her 80s now, but she was saying that in the, f- in the 1950s, she did this crossing from the UK over to America on a ship that was from the 1920s. So in essence, it was one of these ships. And I remember my fiancé had been going through Goodreads and sort of looking at some of my reviews, and she said you've had a review from someone who was on these ships. And I immediately said, I don't want to hear it. I don't, <laughs> I don't want to know what I've got wrong because I was sure this review would just be, well, this isn't accurate at all. <laughs> but in fact, she was actually really complimentary and the review ended with her saying you know, she, it, she felt transported back to that voyage by reading the book. And that was probably the most amazing thing anyone could have said really about what I'd yeah. written. So that was pretty unreal. Oh, that's wonderful. How did you come up with the name? Was that you or was that your publisher? Um, So, uh, well, the name was originally going to be A Fatal Endeavour. So um, the the ship, of course, is called The Endeavour. And I liked the idea of kind of working that word in. But I think we we kind of all, I mean, we realised that it needed to be perhaps be a little more evocative of what was actually going to happen in the book. So we landed on a fatal crossing instead. But I like, I think A Fatal Crossing is actually a much stronger title, you know, having had time... Um, with it, because I I like, of course, you have the crossing from you know Southampton to America, but I like that it's sort mm. of the crossing of various different characters as well, and you have that kind of metaphorical double meaning too, because I guess some of these you know, these encounters that these characters have with each other do turn out to be quite fatal. So um, <laughs> indeed, <yeah. laughs> they do. Yes. Yeah. Right. Well, I've got a few quick fire questions for you now, so let's see how you do with these. Go for it. 1920s or 2020s? Oh, I would say I am I've 1920s only because I'm regularly told I'm an old man in a 28 year old body. So <laughs> I think I am probably better suited to the 1920s. <laughs> Lots of edits or no edits? Lots of edits. I think um, I think the editing stage of a story is when a story actually takes shape and when it becomes good. I think it, was Neil, I think Neil, it was Neil Gaiman. He said that the process of writing your second draft is the process of making it look like you knew what you were doing all along, which is a quote <laughs> that I really, really like. So, yeah, lots of edits, always. Book cover or book title? Oh, that's a good one. Um, cover, I think. I think we are... I think we do absorb information visually, so I do think you look at a cover first and you're brought in by the imagery and the colours, and then I do think... You then, but then the title needs to be good, doesn't it? The title needs to back it up. So I think the cover perhaps is what draws you in first, but then you need a really good title to to seal the deal. So I think both are important, but I think cover probably just edges it. Audiobook or ebook? Ebook, I would say. I, where possible, I like to read read a book myself. Um, I've listened to some amazing audiobooks, and I do have Audible, and I'm always listening to something. But I think if it's a book that I'm really really excited for and really keen for, I like to 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 read it myself so probably an ebook last quick fire one bookshelves arranged by color or by author author always we actually so when we moved into this house um and we were kind of unpacking all of our books my fiance actually did arrange our bookshelves by color um so like in a rainbow (laughs) and it was very nearly the end of our relationship it was um (laughs) so i need i need to order my books by author and then within that by release date and then but then ah, so again coming back to Horowitz I promise I will talk about someone other than Anthony Horowitz but so he has multiple different 
Horowitz series on the go and I have all of his books. So we then have to order that by so all the Horowitz books together and then you divide it by series and then within each series you buy release date. So yeah, that's that's wow. kind of how my, my brain works. <laughs> Yes. Oh, it must be a whole uh, educational phase for you and your fiance as you've got <laughs> to know each other about about, yeah. about that. What What does writing mean to you? I mean, it's 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 my life, I guess. I, that probably sounds really cheesy, but it is what I do no, for a living. So um, when I'm you know when I'm not writing my books, I'm taking on kind of freelance writing jobs. So it it is my living. But again, like for you know when I'm not writing and I'm I'm just doing something for fun usually I am I'm listening to something or I'm reading something about the process of writing so I follow a lot of amazing YouTube channels um, that to kind of do video essays on various films and books and kind of the writing process behind them and I love I love listening to interviews with writers and hearing how they do it and that's an interesting thing as well is how everyone does it slightly differently like there's no one way to approach writing there's no like right way it's just you do you and see what you come out with so but I've always been I've always been writing something so I mean whether it's a story or I mean I'm very I well I, I love music and I play a few different instruments so you know I, I write a lot of music I used to when I was younger I wanted to be a, a film composer I can remember going into a careers appointment and telling the careers advisor I'd like to write music for films one day and all they had to say was I guess you just need to be good at writing music so that was a that was a helpful <laughs> meeting helpful. yeah, was, yeah. Yes. um but no I um I am always writing something. I have loads of things I want to write as well. Like I'd love to write a play one day. I would love to write a TV show. I think one of my my big aspirations is I'd love to write an episode of Doctor Who. Like I have always been. <laughs> a, I, I'm a lifelong Doctor Who fan. So, yeah, writing is. Um, it, it sounds a little cheesy, but yeah, writing is is probably my life. I would say. No, it's not cheesy at all, and uh, you certainly got some more life goals there, which is which is wonderful. Is the process of being published what you expected it would be? Um, I think it takes longer than I thought it would. So that's <laughs> this is slightly embarrassing. I met my agent a couple of years ago now, and uh, well, about two and a half years ago now. I remember it was January, and uh, yeah, we were talking about him him taking on my book, uh, and I prepared some questions for him because I thought that would look really good. <laughs> and one of the questions that I asked him was, "Do you, you know, it's January now? Do you see the book being published this year?" And he just sort of shook his head and just went, no, no, I really don't. <laughs> so um, it's I'm, honest, yeah. And I think the. I think what surprises a lot of people who I talk to, like my family and friends, is how extensive the editing process is. I think there was very much... I remember sort of saying to you know, my folks, like, oh, I, you know, I've signed with my agent and he's really excited about the book, but we need to do a few edits before... You know, he's got a few suggestions before we try sending it off to any publishers. And I think the immediate reaction from a lot of people was, well, why? What's wrong with it? <laughs> it's like there's, mm. there's nothing wrong with it. It's just that there's, this all kind of takes time. So I think the... Yeah, and that's something that I hear from, from quite a lot of, us, say, family and friends, is they're surprised by how extensive and how kind of intense the process is and how many different rounds of, of edits and, and kind of proof checks and that sort of thing. But, I mean, I guess it's important. You know, you've got to make sure you're putting out there is as good as possible. So I think that's probably the most surprising thing. And if you could go back to when you were writing that first draft, is there anything that you would whisper in your ear? Probably just keep going, I think. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, I don't know why. I Don't stop. <laughs> this is it. Because like, when I was writing that book, you know, it was it was a bit of fun. You know, I think I wrote it just to see if I could do it. I guess you know, I would say this story had been in my in my head for the best part of ten years in in some form or another. So it was just to see, you know, can I actually get to the end of something? I never really thought it would be published. You know, I wrote it. I can remember I wrote it on a Monday and a Wednesday evening because that's when my fiance had a gym class, so I had the flat to myself. And then I would write it as well on Saturday and Sunday mornings because I'm an early riser and she likes a lion, so I'd have an hour or two to myself then. And yeah, you know, it was it was very much a bit of fun that I fit around my day job and I I didn't I didn't realistically think would go anywhere. I mean of course you know, I finished it and I thought I'm, I might as well send it off to an agent now because that's what you do and you never know. It might it might all work out. But yeah, I really Every t I think every time I opened my laptop, I thought, this is a bit of fun. Just treat it as that. If no one reads it, then you'll still have achieved something if you, if you finish it. And I didn't think I'd finish it. You know, I think I just, I thought I'll try it and see where this goes and maybe I'll finish it, maybe I won't. And I did and, and it's all panned out really well. So yeah, I guess 
um, yeah, I think I would probably say to myself, just remain confident in yourself and just keep going. And final question, what next? Is is there a book nearly finished? What's happening? I do, yep. So I've just finished my second book. I'm just about to start writing my third. So they are uh, both murder mysteries, um, both kind of old school whodunits in terms of lots of shifty suspects and curious clues and twists and turns. Um, they're both going to be standalones. Um, and the next one is going to be coming out early next year. Um, and it's set in a remote, it's set in a hotel in a remote part of Devon. Um, the whole book will take place in one night, which I thought was quite an interesting challenge when I was writing it. Um, but I think it's turned out quite well. I'm quite pleased with it. So yes, that will be the next one and that will be out next year, which I'm very excited about. Well, we look forward to hearing more about that. Tom Hindle, whose current book out is A Fatal Crossing. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. So coming up, we've got five minutes with Sabine Durant and three more book reviews. Now on to Sun Damage by Sabine Durant. This book. Uh, let's do the blurb first. The heat is intense. The secrets are stifling. She just needs to escape. Nine guests arrive at a remote villa in the south of France. They know each other well, or think they do. But at least one of them has plenty to hide and nowhere to run. Under the relentless sun, loyalties will be tested, secrets revealed and tensions pushed to the point of no return. Let's do a first sentence, shall we? Uh, if I can get to it. Come on, Philippa. Here we go. Chapter one. It was the English voice that caught our attention. The sub schoolgirl French grappling with an order for a demi carafe. We were close to the bar as usual. You tend to pick up most there. She was at a table in full sun. Rookie mistake. One of her shoulders already going red. Fresh off the plane, always a bonus. A British Airways tag hung from the leather straps of her powder blue Longchamp bag. Genuine logo, I'd checked. And the paperback in front of her, spine unbroken, was part of a three for two airport deal. Now, we've got... Well, well let's, let's get Sabine to answer five questions first and then I'll tell you what I think. So Sabine Durrant, author of, well, your latest wonderful book that you're an author of is Sun Damage. Welcome to the Quick Book Reviews podcast. Thank you for having me. It's very good to have you here. It really is. And your first question, can you describe your book in 30 seconds? This book is about a grifter, a young woman who is um, scrappling together a living from um, other people's uh, mistakes, I suppose. She's living off other people. She's under the um, power of um, an older man and she's desperate to escape his clutches and um, she pretends to be somebody else. It's a grift that goes wrong and she takes on the role of uh, somebody, a, a private chef in a villa in the south of France. And it's a wonderfully summer book. I mean, it's based sort of overseas Europe and uh, it's just the right time of year to be reading it, I'd say. I wrote it during the first lockdown, or I started writing it during the first lockdown when um, we were all stuck at home and I was seeing my summer holiday plans dissipate and it was wish fulfillment. It's a novel about wish fulfillment. It's my own summer holiday, <laughs> the holiday I never had. <laughs> so for anyone who's put off flying this year, uh, just sink into this book and, and have your own holiday. I spent a lot of time Googling what the South of France looks like. <laughs> That's great. Um, the next question, who is your favourite smaller character? Not one of the main ones, a smaller one. There's a character called Rebecca in it, who is a middle class, um, rather smug at the beginning, desperate for this holiday. She's a, a mother of teenage children. And when the novel starts, you sort of dislike her. Well, I disliked her. I, she was everything that I dislike in myself. Um, and, uh, and people that you watch on holiday behaving in a sort of ghastly English way on the south of France and but I think the sympathies of our heroine uh, the grifter and our own sympathies as a reader I hope align as we get to see peel behind the layers and get to like Rebecca more by the end of the novel. The next question can you choose three words that you would like readers to feel as they're reading this book? Uh, intrigued, 
um, thrilled, warm both emotionally, but also warm because it's so hot. The book is set in this very, very hot August. <laughs> and also, they I think readers feel rewarded for the story, you know, for trusting you with their time to read this book. It's just a super, super read. Yes, I hope they feel satisfied. That's always the pressure with them. Um, writing any kind of psychological thriller, which is that you want there to be twists and turns, but you want them to be so real and feel lived for the reader as well as for the characters on the page. And it is quite a busy sector for psychological thrillers, I would say. And some of them are quite sort of average and you come across quite similar books, whereas yours... I'm not just saying it because you're because you're here looking at me, but you, yours are different. They are another level, and I really commend you for that. The next question is a very important one. What food and drink did you consume in particular while writing this book? That's a difficult question because the book has a lot of food in it, a lot of bad food in it, um, because she is a, trying to pretending to be a chef, but she actually can't cook at all. What food did I eat? A lot of toast. I always eat a lot of toast and I drink a lot of coffee. So I suppose, although she is trying to make these meals out of food from French supermarkets, I just carried on eating what I normally eat, which is a lot of toast and a lot of tea and a lot of coffee. <laughs> now, let's get in, getting down to technicalities. Does the toast have anything specific on it? Ah, well, if it's in the afternoon, it has Marmite. And if it's in the morning, it normally has marmalade. I love that. That's fantastic. Um, your last question is, what's been the most memorable moment for you so far in your writing career? There's, I'm not sure if I'm really allowed to say it yet, but um, I've had a lot of very exciting film and TV interest in this novel. And um, there was a moment in a particular meeting when I just sat there with these wonderful television producers who I've heard of and watched the amazing television programmes and films that they've made. And they were wanting to buy my book and it was just the most... I thought, this is... Nothing is ever going to cap this wonderful feeling of feeling courted, which is sort of slightly ironic because it's about TV and film rather than books itself. Um, and I suppose the very first... Selling the very first novel was fantastic too. So um, you just keep hoping that it's going to get better and better. Well, it's, it, they all, all are already getting better and better. They're wonderful books. So Sabine Durrant, author of Sun Damage, thank you so much. Thank you very much for having me. I loved this book. It's a great mixture because you've got these con people, you've got the fact that it's set on holiday in Europe, you've got intrigue, you've got a psychological thriller. All of these would be great on their own, but together, just I've written... <laughs> <laughs> this is this is very detailed. I've written wow wow wow. <laughs> um, it's really good. I thoroughly enjoyed it. It kept me reading. It's something that you can just get a grip on, and yet it's a bit different. And I love this con element in it. I really did. Bravo, fabulous. Uh, so that's Sun Damage by Sabine Durrant. Now let's go to the next book, and this was one of my holiday reads. Let me move that piece of paper. Razorblade Tears by S.A. Cosby. I had heard all about this everywhere and I don't know why I hadn't got it, but I, I think I was just waiting for it to come out in paperback um, and I got it. I thought, I'm going to read this on holiday. It's The hardback made it look a bigger book than it is. It's actually about 320 pages. My goodness, you need to read this book. Let, let me do the blurb in the first sentence and then I'll tell you more. Ike Randolph left jail 15 years ago, but a black man with cops at the door knows to be afraid. He is devastated to learn his son, Isaiah, who Ike never fully accepted, has been murdered, along with Isaiah's white husband, Derek. Derek's father, Buddy Lee, who has his own criminal past, may have been ashamed of Derek, but he won't rest until he knows why his only child was killed. Desperate to do better by their sons in death than they did in life, two hardened ex-cons must confront their own prejudices about their children and each other and rain down vengeance upon those who hurt their boys. A provocative revenge thriller and an achingly tender story of redemption. This is a ferocious portrait of grief for those loved and lost and for mistakes that can never truly be undone. Um, let me start with the first sentence. By the way, I must apologise for sounds of shouting because, yes, you guessed it, it's school holidays. And try as I might to get my family to be quiet while I record this, it's impossible. So I 
I apologise profusely for this. In, in, in about six weeks' time, it'll just be you and me again. It'll be quiet. There'll be peace in the house. Can you imagine? Anyway, here we go. Chapter one of Razorblade Tears. Ike tried to remember a time when men with badges coming to his door early in the morning brought anything other than heartache and misery. But try as he might, nothing came to mind. Now, let me get my notes for you, because on holiday, I thought I've got to write notes of every book, because I did read a lot of books. OK, this is what I've written. Five out of five, ten out of ten. A crime thriller with a difference, the essence of a good book. Um, because it's it's pacey, it's gripping. There's lots of violence in it, but I didn't care. I was rooting for these dads to have revenge. You know, it's like, yes, come on, beat up these baddies, do this, do that, go on, save everything, solve the problem, save the world. I was just fully into this. Uh, from now on, S.A. Cosby, if he writes another book, I'm buying it. He's already gone on my auto buy list. This book is amazing. Yes, it's gritty and it's there's gutsy. There's so much to it. Loved it. Amazing. Buy it. Read it immediately. I, I think I've said enough, but it's this is a great book. Great, great, great book. So there we go. <laughs> I think you know what I thought about that one. Um, now we come on to Miracle Cure by Harlan Coben. I took this on holiday. I've had it on my shelves for years. I bought it secondhand. I like a lot of Har Harlan's books um, and I like the premise of this. So let me read you the blurb. Sarah and Michael, the ideal celebrity couple, darlings of the media, until their lives are shattered by a mystery illness. Dr Harvey Riker, his clinic, has found the miracle cure that millions seek. One by one, his patients are getting well. One by one, they are targeted by a serial killer more fatal than the disease. Lieutenant Bernstein, his true desires make him a perfect choice to trap the killer or a perfect victim. Can anyone stop the killer who will do anything to prevent the world's most desperately needed miracle cure? Right, let's do first sentence before, because I have got things to say about this. There is an introduction. I won't read that. OK, prologue. Friday, August 30th. Dr Bruce Gray tried not to walk too fast. He slowed his pace, fighting off the temptation to sprint across the soiled floor of Kennedy Airport's International Arrivals Building, past the custom officials and out into the humid night air. His eyes shifted from side to side. Every few steps he would feign a soreness in his neck to give himself the opportunity to glance behind him and make sure he was not being followed. So this book, again, let me find my notes, although I know, yeah, I know what I'm going to say about this one uh, because I read it more recently. That's why there is a, a letter, a note at the beginning, an introduction from Harlan Coburn. And if he hadn't included that, I would have something very different to say about it. But basically, in the introduction, he says, um, in fact, his first line is, OK, if this is the first book of mine you're going to try, stop now, return it, grab another. It's OK. I'll wait. Uh, and he writes that this was a very early on book, I think his first, one of his first. Um, and his writing has, shall we say, moved on. And he wondered about whether to rewrite the story and decided, you know what? No, he wrote it at the time. He's going to let it fly. But he includes this introduction, this explanation. If he hadn't included that, I would have read this book and thought, what on earth? This is not the Harlan Coburn I know. It's fine, but it's a book. It, it's a book of its time. And I can imagine people 30, 40 years ago, even reading this and, um, uh, you know, it be everyone reading it on a holiday it's like a thriller combined with, I don't know, a, a Jilly Cooper. It's not. It's just, it's got this light touch. Um, and I, yeah, so I enjoyed it. If this was the first book I'd read of his, I he's right in his introduction, I wouldn't have immediately gone on to read more. But what it did make me do is, yeah, it's a decent story. Actually, It's pacey. It's got the twists and turns. It's just... It's just like if you watch a programme that was made some time ago, obviously it's done in a different style and that's the same with this book. Um, but it's made me realise how a writer's um, 
career and the books that they write is not linear. It's not they're not all the same. They do evolve as they write. And this is testament to it. So, yeah, it was interesting. Um, I I'm glad I read it. It's not what I'm going to say to people. Oh, stop. You have to read this book now. But if you are a fan of Harlan, Harlan Coben, I think you might find it interesting to read this to see how far he's come. That makes it sound like it's a terrible book. It's not. It's just a book of its time. So that's that one as well. Um, we're moving through one more book now. This one. Book Lovers. Book Lovers by Emily Henry. OK, let's read the blurb for you. I did take a variety of books on holiday because I didn't know, you know, what I'd, what I'd want to read, what mood I was in. But um, anyway, OK, here we go. Nora is a cutthroat literary agent at the top of her game. Her whole life is books. Charlie is an editor with a gift for creating bestsellers and he's Nora's work nemesis. Nora has been through enough breakups to know that she's the one men date before finding their happily ever after. To prevent another dating dud, Nora's sister persuades her to swap her city desk for a month's holiday in Sunshine Falls. It's a small town straight out of a romance novel, but instead of meeting sexy lumberjacks, handsome doctors or cute bartenders, Nora keeps bumping into Charlie. Let's do the first sentence. Prologue. When books are your life, or in my case, your job, you get pretty good at guessing where a story is going. The tropes, the archetypes, the common plot twists all start to organise themselves into a catalogue inside your brain, divided by category and genre. Uh, I I thought, now, so it's a, it's a good book. People will enjoy it. It wasn't my cup of tea, but I had the wrong expectations. I thought this was going to be a lot more about books which sounds silly because I know it is because of their jobs but I didn't think oh I've learned something new or I didn't know that it didn't give me a taste of the book industry of publishing it's just a holiday romance Sim simple as that and so not for me I'm not saying it's, it's it's not badly written it's nothing like that it just wasn't what I needed from the book and it was just it was just a bit bland for me. But as I say, if I went on holiday and I'm reading Razorblade Tears and what else was I reading? A Stephen King, all sorts. Then understandably, a uh, romance book might not uh, might not do it for me. And this didn't. It was um, perfectly nice for a lot of other people, but it didn't float my boat. It didn't float my book. <laughs> That sounds terrible, doesn't it? But hey, we've reached the end of this podcast. Congratulations, you've succeeded, you've done it. What books have we talked about today? We've talked about A Fatal Crossing by Tom Hindle and Tom very kindly came on to talk to us about that book. Then we had Sabine Durrant, author of Sun Damage, and she came on to answer five questions in five minutes. I also reviewed Razor Blade Tears by S.A. Cosby. If you don't go out and buy that book, shame on you. Um, Miracle Cure by Harlan Coben and Book Lovers by Emily Henry. What a great selection of fabulous books, most of them. And uh, yeah, lots of different um, books for you to think about and see if any uh, sound interesting to you. I hope there's lots that do. I'm off now. Can't wait to speak to you again next week. Will it be quieter next week? Probably not. Will I be less joyful? <laughs> Probably because normal life catches up. Um, but have I got some great books to talk to you about? Yes. Have I got a great author interview? Yes. And have I got a great five in five? Yes. So keep going, look after yourselves and I'll talk to you very soon. Take care now. Bye bye. <laughs> You've been listening to the Quick Book Reviews podcast. That's enough books, said no one, ever. See you again soon.